Hello, uh, welcome all to the sixth lecture in the series uh, of uh, technologies in cell and molecular biology. Um, today, in this lecture, I will first uh, talk about recombinant DNA technology, cloning, and expression. Now, before I start uh, getting into the technical details of it, let me first put it in perspective for you that how this technology is critical for connecting a genotype and phenotype. So uh, I have told you earlier about uh, you know, making these temperature sensitive mutants. Okay, let's go back to our uh, favorite example that you have identified a mutant that cannot grow in presence of galactose as the only carbon source. So it can grow happily in presence of glucose, but galactose as the sole carbon source, the mutant fails to grow. So that means that one of the key genes involved in galactose metabolism is not functional in this particular mutant, right? So the question is, which gene is it? There are 10,000 genes in East, and the time when we are talking about, uh, they did not even know how many. The estimate was popularly much more than this. So, you know, finding it is like uh, finding a needle in a haystack. But how it will be done, forget about that for the time being. If you had the ability to introduce each gene of yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae into this mutant, one gene at a time. Okay? One gene at a time is the key thing. And every gene must be tested. So if you had the ability to test every gene in yeast for its ability to rescue the defect of the mutant that it cannot grow in presence of galactose as the only carbon source, then it is a mutant that is in this mutant function of one of the yeast genes is lost, right? So if you can supply that gene from outside, one gene at a time. So one of the genes in the yeast genome should be able to rescue it, right? So that is the purpose. That is the connection between, you know, mutagenesis screen and recombinant DNA technology in terms of connecting genotype and phenotype. Phenotype is inability to grow in presence of galactose as the only carbon source. Genotype, you test the ability of every gene in yeast uh, genome one at a time and figure out which one can rescue this defect in the mutant cell. And the one that can rescue this defect will be the gene that is, whose function is lost, right? Now the challenge comes that how do you get to this point, this one gene at a time. Because if you open up the yeast cell, first chromosome itself is very difficult to visualize. Even if you, you know, isolate DNA in very large quantity and you can see it under the microscope, Nothing there says, hey, this is the beginning of gene one, end of gene one, then this is the beginning of gene two, end of gene two, and uh, like you can cut with a piece of scissor and put it back in the defective yeast, right? That cannot be done. So that's where the recombinant DNA technology comes in picture. I will elaborate how it happens, but first, some basics. Okay? First is restriction enzyme. In very technical term, it's called restriction endonuclease. 
again let us split the word endonuclease what does it mean nuclease means that splits a nucleic acid endo is within there are two kinds of nucleases there are exonucleases that can chew a dna or an rna from one end and moves towards the middle and the others are endonucleases that cuts the first cut is made in the middle of the dna yeah <clears throat> now how were they discovered you know like uh, one of my favorite uh, line for all of you budding students scientists is that there is often a notion that you know we all should be doing applied research so that humanity is benefited i agree that the end point of practicing science discovering nature is to benefit humans okay like it's not the only end point one of the end points but as far as i understand most of the benefits of science that you were enjoying today were not discovered in the pursuit that let me do this so that i can help mankind they were discovered either accidentally or and or it is not necessarily exclusive in pursuit of something a very fundamental interest basic interest what is this basic interest that scientists discovered that bacteria has some kind of a defense mechanism against the virus that infects bacteria they are called bacteriophages bacteriophage phage genetics is what uh, we are indebted to for whatever we know about molecular biology today the stalwarts the world that studied bacteriophage they gave enormous wealth to the life sciences community and we are still you know uh, benefiting from their discoveries so what they figured out is that if so when phage infects what it does is it only injects the dna genome of the virus bacteriophage inside the bacteria and then depending on which virus bacteria it is it just happily chews off the uh, phage dna and then they figured out that it is uh, cut digested in a very sequence specific manner and then they were surprised to discover that the sequence that they are digesting or they are recognizing to cut the dna is present in the host genome uh, many many times so then they figured out that bacteria has a very smart way of distinguishing what is its own dna and what is coming from outside they have a an enzyme called methylase which methylates host dna so these enzymes of bacteria which cuts the bacteriophage dna in the middle or endonucleases they cannot cut their own dna because they are methylated while the phage dna is not methylated that's the simple difference so this is called host restriction modification system in bacteria so the discovery of restriction enzymes came from this fundamental pursuit of how bacteria are sometimes uh, resistant to infection by phage now you know to cut a long story short when they figured out these uh, like they did a lot of biochemical characterization etc and then they figured out that this restriction in endonucleases they came up uh, with some uh, basic tenets one is that the recognition sequence vary widely okay it is typically between 4 to 8 nucleotides okay and the recognition sequence is a palindrome okay now you should know that this palindrome is not typically in the english language sense how this palindrome is let's see if the within the recognition sequence this is uh, equal equal r1 recognition sequence the first nucleotide is g and the last nucleotide is its uh, complementary base 
the second nucleotide is a T and the second last nucleotide is its complementary base. And so is this. So that's how these are palindromic. And the recognition sequence can be anywhere between four to eight nucleotides. And as I will show you in the next slide, that uh, the names of the enzymes are typically based on the organism in which they were discovered from. Okay, Like uh, E. coli R1, is, it was discovered in E. coli, so it's Escherichia coli, so E from the Escherichia, CO from coli, and restriction endonuclease number one, so E. co R1. Okay, now you see one thing that if the recognition sequence is four nucleotide long, okay, then the first nucleotide can be anything of A, T, G, C, right? Any one of these. Now, the Therefore, the first position of the restriction uh, nucleus can be one of any four. Similarly, the second one can be also one of any four. The third one can also be one of any four. So the probability of a particular sequence being there will be one by four to the power four. In case of E. coli, the recognition sequence is six nucleotide long. So the first nucleotide being a G, the probability is one by four, right? The second nucleotide being a T, the probability is again one by four. So this way, the probability of the occurrence of E. coli restriction, E. coli R1 recognition sequence in the E. coli genome is one like in every one by four to the power six uh, nucleotides. Okay, so uh, that number is, I think, uh, you know, I keep on forgetting like, uh, what that number is. Let me do quick math and uh, figure it out. Yeah, like uh, every 4096 basis, there will be one uh, E. coli recognition site, okay? Now, if the recognition sequence is eight bases long, okay, then it is 4096 times 16. It will be that infrequent. So, therefore, a tetracutter, meaning that recognizes only four bases, occurs more frequently in a gene sequence or in the genome. A hexacutter is relatively less frequent, um, uh, one in 4,000 bases. And a, an octacutter is uh, almost like, you know, one in 65,000, 70,000 bases. Okay, so depending on which kind of uh, manipulation you are trying to do, you may want to choose wisely between a tetracutter or a hexacutter or an octacutter. If you want the DNA to be made into very small fragments, you should go for a tetracutter. Okay? Because, you know, like the frequency of that will be uh, you know 16 multiple no, 1 by 16 multiplied by 1 by 16 that will be uh, you know like every 256 bases something like that okay uh, see, maths is not really my 40 so uh, yeah um, while you, if you want the DNA fragments to be uh, relatively uh, longer, then you know you should go for an uh, octa cutter, like uh, uh, not one, which will cut. Uh, you know, statistically speaking, which will cut every sixty-five thousand bases. Okay, so you should get really large chunks of uh, DNA. So that is the first concept that I wanted to give you. The restriction enzymes uh, vary widely. The, after recognizing the sequence, it can either leave what is referred to as a sticky end or a blunt end. What is a sticky end? A sticky end is where, you know, uh, depending on what kind of an enzyme it is, it will either leave a five prime overhang 
or a three prime overhang. What is a five prime overhang? That this, after this digestion, you know, it is shown here how it will digest. You see that this uh, part in red, which does not have any complementary bases on the other strand, uh, this will have a phosphate group. So this is the five prime end. Okay, this will also have a phosphate group. This is in the five prime end. So these are, uh, you know, this will leave sticky ends with a five prime overhang. Okay? Like uh, this part is uh, still in uh, DNA duplex, and this part is hanging out. Uh, five prime overhang. So these are you know different kinds of restriction enzymes. You can see you know like how EcoR1 is named after Escherichia coli, South 3A is Staph aureus. Uh, so that's how it is uh, South 3A, SMA1 is Serratia marcinescens. Uh, so th this is how the names came. And you know this is a very favorite enzyme of mine and many other uh, scientists, uh, where it is an octacutter, not one. Okay. Not one is very frequently used if you are trying to manipulate or work with very large <coughs> uh, gene sequence, okay? Because as you will see later, that you do not want your restriction site that you will be using for a particular manipulation to be present within the DNA sequence. I, I'll come to that little later. And you see that uh, you know while uh, majority that are shown here, they will uh, uh, yield uh, in uh, sticky ends because they do what is called a staggered cut, meaning the cut on the two strands is not exactly in the same location. But there are some where the cut is in the, exactly the same location. They will give you a blunt ended uh, digestion product. Okay. And they have their own uh, advantages and disadvantages like you know just to I'll, I'll show it to you a little later so now after you have digested a dna now let us say that you want to clone fragments of yeast genome into a plasmid okay what kind of plasmid why we do it we will come to that a little later let's just say for the time being that there is something called a plasmid, which is a circular DNA. Within that, you want to clone fragments of uh, its genome. So what will you do? <laughs> you will cut the vector DNA or the plasmid DNA with a particular restriction enzyme, and you will cut the genomic DNA also with the same restriction enzyme. Okay? And you see the overhang here and the overhang here are basically complementary. So then when you allow them uh, to you know, mix together, then some of these uh, double strand with the overhang will uh, line up with this double strand with the overhang. And uh, you know, like then you can use an enzyme called uh, ligase, which is the one that we mostly use in the laboratory is isolated from bacteriophage T4. So it is called T4 DNA ligase. And you have, uh, you know, like a ligated. So you created a new DNA molecule, which is therefore called a recombinant DNA molecule. Okay. Uh, just uh, to clarify one concept, that a recombinant DNA molecule is any sequence of DNA that is not naturally occurring. So if you take a plasmid coming from Ischerichia coli and put a part of Ischerichia coli genome in that plasmid and clone it, you will actually make a recombinant plasmid. It does not have to be that, you know, uh, when you clone, uh, uh, you know, like a, a human uh, DNA piece inside a, a bacterial plasmid, then it is a recombinant DNA, but if it is uh, within the same species, that is not. That's not the case. The simple definition is, that if you generate any piece of DNA sequence, which is not naturally occurring, which you cannot find in any organism in the nature, then this is a recombinant DNA. Okay. <coughs> and the other advantage is that if in your DNA, DNA, genomic DNA fragment, there are all sorts of fragments with different kinds of overhangs, these will never get into your uh, plasmid. Only this will go. Only this will go here. Okay, so therefore, <clears throat> what you will do is you will cut your plasmid DNA, favorite plasmid DNA, with an enzyme, typically you know 
uh, you call one, and you will cut the genomic DNA also with the same enzyme, and then you will uh, inactivate the restriction enzymes, and now you have digested plasmid DNA and digested genomic DNA, and you simply add ligase, some of them will uh, ligate with each other and will form recombinant DNA. Okay, let's let's put it simple like that. Now, this kind of uh, ligation has, uh, you know, another advantage <coughs> that <coughs> if you want directionality, that you want the DNA sequence from its genome to go into the plasmid in a particular manner. Okay, what is that particular manner? Let me try to illustrate. Let us say that there is something in here which allows transcription of the DNA to happen anything downstream of it. Okay, transcription meaning from DNA you, you can make RNA. So you want that in this if there is a gene and if the genes you know like uh, transcription starts from here you want this to come near this you do not want it the other way around you know like uh, let, let us say this is the other end okay? you do not want this end to come next to it you want only this end to come next to it then what do you do you will cut the plasmid as well as your genomic dna using a pair of enzymes that will ensure directionality. Like how? Let us say on this end, I digested with BAMH1. And this end, I digested with equal one Okay? So if I digest the plasmid DNA also with BAMH1 and equal one then it has no option but to always go here, one this side and two this side. So this is what is why this is called directional cloning. So in directional cloning, the most preferred uh, method is that you will use two different enzymes in combination, both of which will generate sticky end cuts, okay? Please note that if this is your entire length of the genomic DNA, it will cut with equal one. Then it will cut with uh, BAMH1 here. Now, therefore, the fragments that you will generate. Uh, will be one, two, three, four, five, like this, right? So this is how you will generate the fragments. Each of these fragments will have a BAMH1 cut end on one side and an equal one cut end on the other side and you will have uh, the plasmid DNA cut by the same pair of enzymes. So each one of these, let us call this uh, number one, number two, number three, number four, like this. Each one of these will go and form one recombinant DNA. So you will, from this uh, you know, small example, so if there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so you will make eight different plasmid DNA eight different kinds of plasmid DNA. I'm not saying total number is eight. It is just the kind, eight different kinds of recombinant plasmid DNA you will make out of it. Also, I have not introduced you to the concept of uh, gene in the molecular terms yet, but you know, let us just say for the sake of it, okay, uh, Let us say that there is a gene spanning this entire length. So then because of the restriction enzymes that you have used, this length of gene is actually now spread into three different fragments. 
and you will not know it that your restriction digestion has caused this right so this is the reason why depending on your application people will prefer to use octa cutters in place of hexa cutters why because they cut every 65000 bases okay statistically speaking so chances are that you will get much bigger fragments if you use a pair of octa cutters instead of a pair of hexa cutters okay so these are critical considerations when you are trying to digest genomic dna for any kind of manipulations downstream okay so but you got the point right that uh, recombinant uh, dna technology or cloning which involves restriction digestion followed by ligation is a great way of making you know like uh, the dividing the genome into small small recombinant uh, plasmids okay where each of these uh, plasmids will contain a piece of the genome you do not know which piece but a piece of the genome right now once you have uh, done that what well, Okay, how do I get rid of this? Fine. Okay. Fine. So now, you know, like I would strongly strongly advise if you want to learn molecular biology restriction digestion you know, like uh, i have given you only the the tiniest 0.5% of all that is there to learn about restriction digestion you now there are so many ways you can play with it that uh, you know it is difficult for me to give it to you in a lecture you learn it only when you do it but when you are doing it if you want to consult a resource i can guarantee that there is no resource better than this particular company's website it's a company website new england biolabs is a company that we all swear by when it comes to using their restriction enzymes etc et and that company's website has this very detailed resource you know i have used it during my phd and my uh, seniors have used it before me you get all sorts of uh, information there you know, one term is isoschizoma what is an isoschizoma is isoschizoma is a restriction enzyme that recognizes the same sequence as another restriction enzyme so these two restriction enzymes are isoschizomers okay this recleavable filled in overhang you know you might sound a little strange so often these are tricks that you need to use like you know you are trying to uh to clone a piece of dna in a particular vector okay and you figured out that the only pair of restriction enzymes with which the vector can be digested are present smack in the middle of the dna that you want to clone therefore if you use those enzymes then uh, you know your uh, dna of interest will be uh, cut uh, in multiple pieces so your cloning strategy will be very difficult so what you can do is you can actually consult this nmd database and very smartly cut with a completely unrelated uh, enzyme which generates a sticky end once the sticky end is generated you fill it in with uh, an enzyme called cleno okay cleno just uh, fills up the overhang part and it will generate a new restriction site okay you have to draw it on a piece of paper to figure out how that works uh, it is difficult for me to teach you like this um, and then now you have a new restriction site so you can consult such uh, resources very carefully and you will uh, you know get uh, very uh, interesting uh, insight when you are actually trying to work on the bench okay now let us come to straight the point that you want to clone the 
like you want to test you know whether a particular gene is you know mutated in a yeast cell or something like that so if you want to clone the entire genome into a plasmid then just think of the enormity of the task if you're talking about human genome it has 6 into 10 to the power 9 bases. So even if you are getting decent sized fragments like 3000 base pair fragments, you will have 2 million, 20 lakh pieces of DNA from one human cell. Do you realize the enormity of the problem that how do you handle such very large number of pieces? And this number is very important for you to keep in your mind that if you cut a human genome with a restriction enzyme or a pair of restriction enzymes that will generate on an average 3000 base fragments, you will get 2 million bases from one cell, okay? 2 million pieces of DNA. Typically, you know, when you were dealing with, uh, you know, uh, any such work, you are typically working with you know, millions of cells. Can you now imagine how many number of absolute DNA fragments you are generating? Yes, there will be 2 million unique fragments, but each unique frag fragment will have multiple you know, members, copies. So this is an enormous problem. This was solved by recombinant DNA technology, and you will see how it was uh, solved. So, uh, you know, uh, you have your DNA fragments, you have your vector, you clone it, you make your recombinant DNA plasmid, and then you put it inside of a bacterium, okay? Um, let's say E. coli, okay? There are methods by which you can force E. coli to take up a piece of circular DNA plasmid, uh, circular DNA, plasmid DNA, okay? These plasmids uh, can be naturally occurring in uh, yeast and in bacteria. Uh, but, you know, for recombinant DNA technology, we engineer those plasmids that are naturally occurring plasmids uh, and then work with those. And then <laughs> you take this and you put it inside the bacteria, right? So you, I gave you some idea about the number of fragments, right? If you expect or even 1% of that, 2%, like a 0.1% of that to have been cloned in a plasmid vector, you are talking about billions of circular recombinant plasmids, okay? So you will, you are now forcing it to get inside the bacteria. You will be dealing with you know, few billions of bacteria. Now, you know, this process of taking up the DNA by the bacterium is not 100% efficient, you know, depending on how good you are or how good your reagents are. It can vary anywhere between, you know, 0.1, 0.2% to 5%, 10%. Okay. So that means a good number of bacterium will not be will not take up the any recombinant uh, plasmid that you were trying to introduce. So now your first job is to separate the two, that the bacterium that took up a recombinant plasmid and the bacterium that did not. That is done by what is referred to as antibiotic selection. Okay, You all know about it, so I will not uh, labor that point. You <coughs> are using a particular gene called beta-lactamase, which is naturally occurring in uh, bacteria. That is uh, 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 actually naturally occurring in bacterial plasmid only. Uh, so uh, because your plasmid has that sequence, which is referred to as the sample resistance sequence, uh, so any bacterium that has that um, uh, plasmid will be able to grow in a plate containing ampicillin, and the others that did not take it up, they will not be able to grow, okay? Now, please note that I'm not using the word die, though in your textbook it says that, 
uh, but I am saying that they will not be able to grow. Okay? Keep that in mind. So now, uh, giving a little detail of the vectors, uh, there are uh, uh, E. coli plasmid vectors or uh, bacteriophage based vectors, uh, which are called phage based. I'm not getting into the detail of it. So, uh, as I said, the E. coli plasmid vectors, they are naturally occurring and they provide certain advantages to the host. They, you know, one is uh, that they carry the antibiotic resistance genes often. Mm, and this is the reason why, you know, like uh, this antibiotic resistance is a, a deadly problem because this is a mobile DNA element, like it's a circular DNA plasmid. It can move from one bacterium to the other. Uh, so it can make the whole population antibiotic resistant. Therefore, we are all advised to uh, take antibiotics wisely and not so frequently, etc. That's a different topic for another day. Okay. Now, E. coli plasmids can be engineered. Okay. Uh, um, so you will hear two terms in recombinant DNA technology. One is a cloning vector and another is, a, uh, is an expression vector. In the new age, there are some vectors that are equally good for both the purposes. But let us first understand what is the purpose of a cloning vector. A cloning vector, its objective is <coughs> to grow a particular piece of DNA in very large quantity, okay? So therefore, it should be very efficiently replicated in the bacterial cell. Okay? So they will have an origin of replication, okay? Any plasmid vector will have, uh, that, that is used for cloning, or any plasmid vector will have an origin of replication. We will see a little later when we will talk about shuttle vectors that this origin of replication, uh, if uh, you know, like uh, the plasmid will have to, like if you desire the plasmid to replicate even in a host other than E. coli, then you will have to have two different origins of replication. I'll come to that a little later. It must have a multiple cloning site. What is a multiple cloning site? It's a stretch of DNA that is artificially created, it is very heavily crowded with some uh, uh, recognition sequence for restriction enzymes, which are commercially easily available. Okay, so that, that gives you many different ways of cloning a particular piece of DNA into the uh, cloning vector. They should have these kind of sequences. This T3, T7, SP6, these are all names of bacteriophages. Uh, they're uh, you know, like uh, the 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 uh, RNA polymerase from these uh, fudges, uh, they are single subunit proteins. Okay, uh, like unlike the E. coli or human RNA polymerases, uh, which are multi subunit, they are uh, like uh, single subunit protein. So therefore, much easier to deal with. So you will have those kind of uh, uh, promoter sequences inserted in the upstream of the multiple cloning site. Okay. So what there are, or and sometimes even downstream. So what that does, uh, it gives an advantage to make an RNA copy of the DNA. Okay. So you have the plasmid, circular plasmid, in vitro or in vivo, depending on how you want it. The, if you can manage this polymerase protein to be provided, then it will bind to the T3 promoter and transcribe the DNA downstream of it. Sometimes, as you will see later, we can manage to transcribe it from the other end as well. Okay, so then that we will come to that later. And because these are typically 20 nucleotide long sequences, these are very useful for designing primers for sequencing. Okay, we will learn about that a little later. But you know, a cloning host must provide ease of uh, sequencing and making uh, transcripts for the, um, uh, the corresponding DNA sequence. Okay. Um, then it must have a method of selecting for successful cloning. To explain, let's get back to this slide all the time. So see, uh, here, when you are transforming a recombinant plasmid into the bacteria, you are 
selecting the transformed bacteria by uh, resistance to uh, you know like a bacterial sexidal uh, effect of uh, ampicillin okay however this cannot distinguish between the two possibilities that the plasmid is there and it has a foreign piece of dna in it or the plasmid is there it just did not have a foreign piece of dna in it how can that happen see this is the linearized plasmid right now intramolecular reactions a millions fold more efficient than intermolecular reaction so this piece having a chance of interacting with this piece and then forming the recombinant dna that probability is much less than if there is an option for this one to self ligate that is much much more efficient and what typically happens is that when you are doing this double digestion there is little bit of inefficiency in each of the digestions okay digestion with restriction enzyme 1 and digestion with restriction enzyme 2 as a result in the pool of linearized plasmid dna majority will be digested with both restriction enzyme 1 and 2 but some will be digested only with restriction enzyme 1 or only with restriction enzyme 2 and those will very readily they will linear they, they will ligate and become circular again much more efficiently than the vector plus insert combo and therefore that you will not be able to distinguish at this level okay so that is the reason why you want this uh, kind of a selection you must have a method of selection for successful cloning just by looking at the bacteria you should be able to tell if this bacteria has a recombinant plasmid and this bacteria does not one is a blue white selection okay uh, i know many of you who have done your btech msc you think that you know your blue white selection but i have my doubts okay uh, so this is you know like a quiz for you that give me like uh, let me know uh, how exactly blue white selection occurs Okay, uh, you have to tell me exactly molecularly how blue white selection works. Okay, um, so I will uh, you know, ask you one of these days. So that is a color based selection, it has its uh, advantages, but there are some disadvantages. Uh, lately, another fantastic method of uh, selection has come, which is a vital selection. This is so brilliant, you know, like uh, imagine the multiple cloning site sequence, this, this sequence, okay? It is, and imagine that there is a gene Imagine that this whole thing is a gene, okay? Starting from here all the way to here. And imagine that that gene codes for a bacterial toxin, meaning if that gene product is made, bacteria will be dead, okay? If that gene product is made, bacteria will be dead. And it is engineered in, in a manner that in the middle of that gene sequence, your multiple cloning site is there. You can do it with codon degeneracy and all those uh, smart manipulations, you can do it. Now what will happen is if an insert is cloned in between, okay, somewhere here there is an insert, so that will then disrupt the coding sequence of the toxin. So if there is a successful cloning, then and only then you will have a live bacterial colony. If it is a plasmid that is self ligated, then the bacterial colony will not be able to grow because it will be producing its own toxin. Therefore, this is called a vital selection. Okay? 
So I told you about vital selection because perhaps you have never, never learned about it, but I know that most of you have learned about blue-white selection. I request that you please study on your own and explain to me one of these days how blue-white selection actually works. Okay? It is very important that you understand it because many other technologies that have been developed in last 10, 15, 20 years depends on the same concept as blue-white selection. Okay, you will come. Uh, I, I will ask you. So this is how your uh, you know uh, multiple protein sites uh, look like. They are also called polylinker sequences. I don't have to get into all the details. You can you know, clone to prevent self ligation of the plasmid, the cloning host, cloning vector. Sometimes we use a smart strategy. That is, this is how you digest the DNA and they have five prime overhang, so there are these phosphate groups, okay? These phosphate groups are very, very important for cloning because when you are making the recombinant DNA, you are joining one piece of DNA with another piece of DNA that is purely a esterification reaction. You form phosphodiester, right? So on the side of phosphate, there are esters on both sides. So if you don't have the phosphate group, then they cannot form the ester. So they cannot self ligate it. So, you know, we have removed the phosphate. There are, there are enzymes called phosphatases. You treat with them. Now it cannot self ligate it because there is no phosphate group for forming the phosphodiester. Now, when you provide the insert, you have not removed the phosphate from there. So now that brings the phosphate group, ensuring that any ligation, if it happens, it only happens between uh, with the insert in the middle and the vector uh, overhangs on both sides. Okay, so use of uh, phosphatases is a way of, uh, in our uh, parlance, we call it reducing the background in cloning. What, what do you mean by background? Meaning plasmids that self ligated without any insert uh, in it, they're not really recombinant DNA. Um, now, you know, uh, you uh, do it and uh, you, there is one thing that I should uh, inform you that bacteria has one property because of which recombinant DNA technology is possible. That is that within a bacteria, a particular plasmid can multiply in many copies, okay? Particularly cloning vectors, uh, they are put inside cloning hosts, meaning appropriate E. coli cells, which uh, could to put the cloning vectors in there. There is a called high copy plasmids, meaning in a particular bacterium, they will be present in many, many copies. But in the same bacterium, you cannot have another plasmid having the same origin of replication. Meaning two different recombinant, two different kinds of recombinant DNA cannot be inside the same bacterium. If that restriction was not there, recombinant DNA technology would have been a very, very difficult uh, thing to achieve, okay? So this is one property of bacteria that we are enormously grateful to the bacteria for, uh, that it has this uh, exclusion principle by which um, two different kinds of uh, recombinant DNA, you know, like the same plasmid, Let, let's name some names, like say PGM7Z. Okay, so uh, in a particular bacterium, there can be hundreds of copies of PGM7Z without any insert. In a bacterium, you can have hundreds of copies of PGM7Z having genomic DNA fragment number one. 
in a bacterium, you can have hundreds of copies of PGM7Z, recombinant PGM7Z, having genetic DNA fragment number two. But you cannot have a bacterium which will have one plasmid of PGM7Z carrying genomic fragment number one and recombinant plasmid of PGM7Z carrying genomic fragment number two. Two different kinds of recombinant DNA cannot coexist in the same bacterium. Okay, so with that, I am uh, stopping this class and I will get back to you with the next lecture soon.